Welcome, please, Dr. George Wood as he comes to share the word of God. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a joy to be with you again today. This is the day the Lord has made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. Amen and amen. What a privilege it is to come back to Christ's gospel. This is the eighth time since 2006 that Reverend Hicks has given me the privilege of coming and being with you. And I want to thank her and thank all of you for the wonderful hospitality and friendship that you've shown to me and my wife and members of our, our family over these years. Thank you, Reverend Hicks, for your faithful service to the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sterling example you are to all of us, for the way you've taught us and led us in the ways of the Lord. We deeply love you and appreciate you. I was telling Sister Hicks that I, I travel a lot. In fact, this week I've been in California, uh, Springfield, Missouri, Milwaukee, and here. And just it uh, goes on and on. But there is nowhere in the world uh, where there is someone who is a better uh, display of hospitality than Reverend Bernice Hicks. She absolutely goes over the top. And... Uh, so deeply, deeply appreciate her and all the members of the staff here, and it's just so, so kind to us. You know, it was uh, 60 years ago that I first came to Jeffersonville. For those of you that may not have heard me in the past, my roots are here as a 13-year-old boy. And my parents came, uh, they had uh, left the mission field to China and Tibet, and uh, had pastored several other places, came here. Mom was uh, 56 at the time, and Dad was 40, uh, 46. Ten-year age gap, but that, they met on the mission field. They actually courted on the boat going to China, and they were the only two single as some of the God missionaries going to Northwest China. So what was ten years age difference, you know? The law of propinquity kicked in. You marry who's near you. And uh, <laughs> so I'm the third and the youngest child uh, to that family, but... Uh, my parents, uh, for two and a half years, sought to get the work going at Chestnut and Graham, and Dad worked in a factory across the river in Louisville. My mother sold Avon uh, to help provide the in family income. I sold Grit Magazine and then got a, uh, uh, got a newspaper route in Jeffersonville. And um, I remember when my mother would come back in with that Avon bag slung over her shoulder, and, and I'd uh, say to her, because... Uh, Pentecostal women in, in those days at least, and some today, uh, did not use uh, makeup or lipstick. And I would say to mother, you've been out pushing that lipstick again? Like she'd been selling drugs, you know? And uh, she, uh, she'd get very defensive and square her shoulders and she'd say, now Georgie, she said, I don't, I don't sell it, but if people ask for it, I, I sell it to them, but I don't, I don't push it on them. And, and she said, but Avon has many other fine products, you know? <laughs> And, um, but after two and a half years, my dad's health broke, and um, I, uh, we left, and a short time after that, Reverend Hicks bought a little property at Chestnut and Graham, and God gave uh, tremendous growth, as you know, to this church and its worldwide influence. It was um, a time or two that I was here last that I really had an incredible spiritual moment on the platform during the worship service, and by the way, uh, you do, do you realize how privileged you are with the kind of music and worship you have here? It's unbelievable. Uh, I was here and just, and, I, and as I had done when I was here before, I, 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 it's just natural to ask this question. Lord, why did my parents not, uh, didn't seem to be successful here? Uh, they left uh, with dad's health broken and the church just never caught fire. And yet Sister Hicks came and this marvelous congregation and the work of God thrived. Why, why, why was that? Why, why did that? Why was that? I've struggled with that my whole life because my parents, after they left Jeffersonville, never really talked about it again. It was their one failure in ministry. Today there's a church in Northwest China, 15,000 believers that they laid the foundation for and, and churches, uh, several churches across this country that are tremendously uh, vital today that they laid the root uh, of it. But... Um, here it was not so. And they left and felt that they were failures. And as I was pondering that again, here on the platform, yeah. one of the last times I was here, I felt the Spirit say to me, um, your parents pounded hard on the hard wall of Jeffersonville, Indiana, yeah. and they didn't break through. But what you don't know 
is that they weaken the wall. They weaken the wall. And when Sister Hicks came, she just had to put that one fist through the wall and bang, it went right on through. That brought such uh, comfort to me. You know, the scripture says that, we're, uh, that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And there are times when we may have the feeling that it is, but it never is. It's never in vain. Well, I want to thank you also for uh, giving to us uh, your choice servant, Saul and Winnie Arlitz. Uh, I want to just show you what Saul is doing. Now, I've got a picture, if we can put it up. If we can't, why, that's okay too. Ah, there it is. This is our uh, Summons God headquarters, and Saul now runs this entire establishment. Well, that's not exactly true, but, uh, <laughs> but he is the chief operating officer. I'm the chief executive officer. He's the chief operating officer, and Winnie is vice president for church ministries. We have 800 employees uh, in, in that building and other buildings that are, that are around it, and doing the worldwide work of Jesus Christ. And uh, Saul and Winnie are just God uniquely prepared them for that role. And had it not been for reconnecting to Jeffersonville, I would have never met them. And we would have, in the Assemblies of God, been poorer for it, much poorer. We've just celebrated our 100th birthday two months ago, a tremendous celebration. Uh, Pastor Bill Hudson and Elizabeth were with us for that event. And... Uh, it was a time of rejoicing as we celebrated what God is doing around the world. Uh, every 21 seconds through an Assemblies of God Church or Ministry, somebody is coming to Jesus Christ. Seven days a week, 365 days a year. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And uh, as we continue to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we'll continue to see God work. There's a great unfinished task, and we're about that. Well, today I want to direct your attention to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 9 through 18, and talk to you about the Christ of Christ's Gospel Church, the Christ who reveals himself to Christ's Gospel Church. Revelation 1, beginning at verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, or lampstands. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his face as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. As the Apostle John writes this, the apostolic era is closing. Of the Twelve apostles, Judas, of course, left too early. I wonder what would have happened if Judas, like Peter, would have stuck around and witnessed the resurrection. I suspect that Jesus would have forgiven him as well. But the missionary journeys are over, the apostles are gone, and only John is left. It's evident by reading the book of Revelation, especially chapters 2 and 3, that the churches were struggling against external pressures and internal problems. In fact, those pressures of persecution and those internal problems are so great that if you had been living in the church at that time, you would have wondered, has it all been in vain? Sixty years have gone by since the resurrection. Would the church even survive into the next generation, let alone the next 20 generations? 
It is in that kind of context that we have the book of Revelation. The word itself, apocalypsis, means away from hiding. Therefore, it is unveiling what is hidden. And what is hidden is the ongoing power of Jesus Christ to enliven our lives and resurrect and maintain his church. So John says, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It's when we're in the Spirit, not when we're in the natural. If you looked at the natural in Revelation 1, you would say the church is going to be finished within a few years. It's rent by division and rent by heresy. It's facing the mailed fist of Domitian. People are being crucified left and right. It's the same situation we see today all across the landscape with ISIS executing Christians. Uh, and even in the West and in America, Christians being increasingly marginalized. I think we're getting ready for tough days that are ahead of us. We're already in them. We have a society and a secular culture that is opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you see these external pressures, you see problems within the body of Christ itself, and you wonder, is, is the church strong enough to survive? I've got a simple answer to that. It's strong enough to survive because it has a Savior and because it has one who has risen from the dead. So in the Spirit, we see some things more clearly. We're in the natural, we can get very pessimistic. But in the spirit, we see Jesus more clearly. When Jesus was in the flesh, John had leaned on his breast as his friend. But now he's far more than John's friend. He's John's Lord, and so John falls at his feet as though dead. He who had leaned on Jesus' chest now falls at his feet. Yeah. And that's what Jesus is to us. He is the one closer to us than our brother, but he is also our Lord for, before whom we prostrate our lives and all that is us. We not only see Jesus more clearly, we see his church more clearly. It's first and foremost his church. His church. When I pastored, I tried to avoid the use of the personal pronoun my. It was never my church. It's always his church. I am a trustee of his church. And Jesus, guess what, is in the midst of the church. This imperfect church, these seven churches of Revelation, he is in the midst of his church. And the church is represented by candlesticks or better translation, lampstands. And guess what? They're golden. Yeah. Jesus sees the church as golden. Yeah. We may fault the church. We may see its problems. But Jesus himself sees the problems, as we well know. But still, the church is golden to him. It's precious to him. He shed his blood for the church. He is the one who sits on the throne and walks among his churches. He's in both places at once. He is sitting on the throne, but he is walking amidst the churches. And he's walking amidst us today. Jesus always knows what's going on. He says to each of the seven churches, I know, I know, there's nothing hidden from him. So we see the church more clearly. And guess what? We not only see Jesus more clearly and the church more clearly, but when we are in the Spirit, we see ourselves more clearly. Each letter is addressed to the angel of the church, which is a code word uh, for the word pastor. It's the importance of leadership in listening to the Lord. And when we listen to him, we see our role more clearly. And in fact, when there is a manifestation of his presence, he gets real big and we get real small. So these verses of Revelation 9 through 18 tell us about the person to whom Jesus reveals himself, the place where Jesus reveals himself, and the portrait of Jesus that's revealed in power and authority. The person, the place, and the portrait. First, let's look at the person to whom Jesus reveals himself. John says, I, John, the disciple known for faith and love, reveals himself in several different ways. First, his servant. His servant. I am struck by that identifying term because in the broader Pentecostal and charismatic world today, which I'm very familiar, there is a wave on titles. Uh, 
Some are looking to be called apostle. Some are looking to be called prophet. And all that's, I guess, okay if you, if you are a real apostle, if you are a real prophet, if you don't just go on TV and collect money from innocent people who should be giving their money to their local church and other places, but that's just a side issue. There are a lot of self-appointed apostles and prophets today that are running around without a title but not running around with any power. But John, John could have used the word apostle. He could have used the word prophet. Instead, he calls himself servant. What is the greatest need in the church of Jesus Christ today are servants of the living God, servants of Jesus Christ. John is not concerned with authority or status, but with service. That's a far cry from when he was an immature disciple. Remember in the Gospels, when he and his brother wanted to sit on Jesus' left and right hand, and when their ever-ambitious mother wanted the same for them. The Lord is not looking for great Christians or great preachers or great missionaries. He's looking for great servants. Jesus said, for you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Even Jesus himself took a towel and served. I had a very fascinating experience a couple weeks ago. I was invited to address the, uh, to be a keynote speaker for the Church of God in Christ in Memphis, Tennessee for the celebration of the 150th birthday of their founder, uh, Bishop Charles Mason. Uh, the last, uh, the, it, is, it was the same pulpit from which Martin Luther King preached his last sermon before he was assassinated. It was a, a very uh, significant honor that a member of the Assemblies of God, which uh, had its roots in the Church of God in Christ, uh, would be asked for the first time ever to address uh, that assembly. I brought with me a gift uh, uh, that is similar in nature to what sits on Reverend Hicks, Hicks' desk, and that is a statue of Jesus uh, washing the feet of, the, of Peter. And as I presented that gift to Bishop Mason, I said, uh, in this way, symbolically, I would like to represent that as we look over the landscape of a century of racial division, in this country and even among Christians, I would like for this statute to represent the Assemblies of God washing the feet of the Church of God in Christ. And I, I think we, I, while we may literally not do foot washing, I don't know if you do, but I, we, we've pretty much, that practice is, we, we've shelved it in the Assemblies of God for whatever reason, I don't know. Maybe it's because of nylon hose and socks, I'm not sure. But, but we ought to be washing one another's feet. At least in a spiritual sense, we're here to serve one another. We're not here to lord it over one another. I love what Mother Teresa said uh, when she was interviewed by a Time magazine reporter. She said, I, he basically was asking her, what, what, what do you do? Who do you think you are? And her response was, I am just a little pencil in the hand of God. I am just a little pencil in the hand of God. So John says, I'm a servant. And then he says, I'm your brother. Servant defines our relationship to the Lord. Brother defines our relationship to one another. I never cease to be amazed at divisions in the body of Christ. It's, um, it's very troubling. Jesus did not say, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you all agree with one another. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Amen. Love one another. Love is the key, isn't it? As we heard in the special music this morning. I love this little story I ran across, and you'll forgive me for using it, but it's kind of, kind of a little bit serious and a little bit humorous. This person said, I was walking across the bridge recently. I spied this guy who looked like he was ready to jump off. So I thought I'd try to stall him until authorities showed up, at least until I had time uh, to, uh, to try to talk him out of it. And I said to him, don't jump. And he said, why not? Nobody loves me. And I said, God loves you. You believe in God, don't you? Yes, I believe in God, he said. Good, I said. Are you Christian or Jewish? Christian, he said. Me too, I said. Protestant or Catholic? Protestant, he said. Me too, I said. What kind of Protestant? Pentecostal, he said. Me too, I said. Independent Pentecostal or denominational Pentecostal? <laughs> 
Independent Pentecostal, he said. Me too, I said. New Evangelical, Moderate Independent Pentecostal or Conservative Independent Pentecostal? <laughs> conservative Independent Pentecostal, he said. Me too, I said. Calvinistic, Conservative Independent Pentecostal or Lose Your Salvation Arminian, Conservative Independent Pentecostal? <laughs> well, he said, Love Your Salvation Arminian, Conservative Independent Pentecostal. Me too, I said. Dispensational, premillennial, lose your salvation, Armenian, conservative, independent, Pentecostal, or non uh, dispensational, premillennial, lose your salvation, Armenian, conservative, independent, Pentecostal. He answered, dispensational, premillennial, love your salvation, Armenian, conservative, independent, Pentecostal. Me too, I said. Against women in ministry, dispensational, premillennial, love your salvation, <laughs> Armenian, conservative, independent, Pentecostal, or for women in ministry, dispensational, premillennial, love your salvation, Armenian, Lose Your Salvation, Armenian, Conservative, Independent, Pentecostal. He said, four women in ministry, dispensational, premillennial, Lose Your Salvation, Armenian, Armenian, Conservative, Independent, Pentecostal. Ah, you heretic, I said, and I pushed him over the bridge. How often it is in the body of Christ we divide over preferences. The blood of Jesus Christ has made us one. If you love Jesus Christ, you're my brother, you're my sister. We're in the family of God. So John calls himself the person who is a servant, the person who is a brother, and the person who is your companion. The island had not made him isolated. He said, I share some things with you. And the things he shared were, for example, I share with you your companion, your companion in tribulation. The word is used to describe the grinding of wheat in a mill or the crushing of grapes or olives in a press. It's the squeeze. It's the grinding pressure that at first appears to crush and ruin, but through crushing makes grain to flour, grapes to wine, and olives to oil. Oswald Chambers said it beautifully, God can never make us wine if we object to the fingers he uses to crush us with. If God would only use his own fingers and make me broken bread and poured out wine in a special way, but when he uses someone whom we dislike, or some set of circumstances to which we said we would never submit and makes those the crushers we object. We must never choose the scene of our own martyrdom. If we are going to be made into wine, we'll have to be crushed. You cannot drink grapes. Grapes become wine only when they are squeezed. I wonder what kind of finger and thumb God has been using to squeeze you, and you have been like a marble and escaped. You are not ripe yet, and if God had squeezed you, the wine would have been remarkably bitter. On Patmos, John is being squeezed. At 90 years of age, he should have had his retirement plan. He should have had a nice villa on the Mediterranean, not a prison on that small island of Patmos. And he is separated from his friends that are on the mainland some many miles away at Ephesus. In fact, it's really fascinating when you come to John 21 and John 22 and see the listing of the seven things that are no more, the first thing that the Spirit causes John to say as no more is no more see, S-E-A. That is not a word I would have chosen. I would have chosen no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, no more night, but John's first word is no more sea. Why is that? Because the sea was the separation between him and the people that he loved. It was part of the tribulation that he was separated from them. But he sees that day when there will be no more separation. No more sea. Praise God. I was saying, as I was sitting here listening to this wonderful music, uh, I thought, I wish Judy Lynn were here. I, I, the only church I know where you can hear someone yodel and someone sing opera at the same, in the same service. This, this is incredible. I love it. It's like playing all the keys on the spiritual piano. Some churches only play one or two keys. This church plays all 64 keys. But Judy's now 
on the other side. There's coming a day when there's no more separation, no more sea. But John says, I'm sharing that tribulation with you. I'm being, I'm being squeezed. There is popular teaching today, even among Pentecostal and charismatic circles, that if you suffer, you must have stepped outside of the will of God. And there must be something wrong with your life or you don't have faith. They have done what Thomas Jefferson did to the New Testament. They cut out all the verses they didn't like. The New Testament has a great deal to say about the squeeze, about pressure, about tribulation, about suffering. So John says, I'm a companion with you. I'm a companion with you in the tribulation, but I'm also a companion with you in the kingdom. Wow! Who would call an island prison a kingdom? But he is a companion in the kingdom. John's circumstances looked out of control. He could have asked, where is God's rule? Rome looked mighty, just as Islam looks mighty today. In fact, I, one of our, uh, the leader of our Iranian church about 20 years ago was martyred for his faith, Edward Hosepian, and his testament was the greatest thing that ever happened to the Church of Jesus Christ in Iran is Khomeini, the Ayatollah. Why? Because generations of young people are getting so disenchanted with that form of Islam and with Islam in particular that they are turning. I just got a report this week that the number of estimated Christians in Iran today in the last decade more than outnumbers all persons who've come to Iran to Christ in the last 20 centuries. My friend Dr. Peter Kuzmich who is the leader of the uh, Pentecostal uh, communities throughout the Balkans uh, said uh, that when he was growing up, uh, his father was a pastor. In fact, I've preached in his father's church. And, and, uh, and Peter was a very bright, incredibly intelligent young man. And by the time he was in high school, the secular system had washed out his Christian faith. And Peter, the pastor, the Pentecostal pastor's son, whose dad didn't have more than the third grade education, Peter became an outspoken atheist and president at his high school of the Communist Youth League. He would come home and he'd argue with his father, argue Marxism with his father. And his father would get very frustrated because his father didn't have the intellectual firepower to argue back everything his young son was saying. But Peter said, one thing my father would always say that would stop the argument, he would say, Peter, I want you to know this. Jesus is my friend, and Jesus never lied. And Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world, and then the end will come. Yes. He said, I don't know if this will happen in my lifetime or happen in yours, but there will be a day when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached freely all over the Soviet Union. Yes. Just a couple years ago, I preached to 3,000 pastors of the community in Russia that is associated with our world of some is a God fellowship. We are planting 10,000 churches more in Russia in this decade. And in the Ukraine, the Pentecostal church is growing leaps and bounds all throughout the former Soviet Union. There is a church that is coming alive that looked like it was dead just 20, 30, 40 years ago. The same in China with an estimated 100 to 150 million believers today in China, whereas Mao thought he would crush it. In fact, in the church I preached at in Perm, Russia, which is the headquarters of uh, 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 th that church also serves as the headquarters for the 3,000 existing Pentecostal churches. There is, they bought the former Communist Party Cultural Hall uh, and, and there is in front a pedestal about 20 feet in the air and on top of that pedestal is a bust of Lenin which they uh, cannot take down because of its historical significance in the town. And I said to Edward Grabovenko, the pastor, I said, Edward, I said, don't ever take that pedestal down. Don't ever take statue, the statue of Lenin, the head of Lenin down because Lenin is dead, but what stands behind Lenin is the church, and the church lives. The New Testament connects the tribulation and the kingdom by saying, Jesus saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. I've seen that time and time again in the course of my life. But there's more than that. There's the patient endurance. This is the bridge between tribulation and kingdom. John's being on Patmos was out of his control, but he served him who had control. So endurance or patience, it's a Greek word, hupomeno, which means to abide under. 
Psalm 40 puts it this way, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you have planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. For troubles without number surround me. Yes. Isn't that life? Yes. The Lord has done so many things for us, but troubles without number also surround us. Yes. Number on both sides of the fence. I love uh, what uh, one, of, uh, one of the leading... Uh, Bible scholars of our day, Dr. Vernon Grounds, uh, said about the time when he was in, in seminary as a seminary student in St. Paul, Minnesota, and about uh, 10 o'clock at night, when the guys were done studying, they'd go across the street to a high school gymnasium where the custodian would let them uh, scrimmage, play basketball, and because the seminary didn't have a gym. And he said that uh, one night... Uh, they were playing and he noticed that the custodian, an elderly black custodian who would let them use the gym, was sitting up in the stands. He'd evidently finished his rounds and rather than shooing the guys out of the gym uh, and, and uh, to enable him to go home, he was, uh, he was letting them finish their game. And, and Vernon Ground said, I thought that was so nice of this man to do this. So he said, I broke away from the game and I walked over to him and as I got closer to him, I noticed that he was, uh, he was reading the Bible. But I, so I, I said to him, I knew what he was reading, but I said to him, what are you reading? Expecting him to say, I'm reading the Bible. Instead, uh, he said, I'm reading the book of Revelation. And Vernon Grounds was having a class at that time in seminary on theories of interpretation of the book of Revelation, of which there are a number, the poetic, the idealist, the historicists, the uh, futurists, uh, the dispensational, non-dispensational, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, amillennial, millennial, post-millennial, <laughs> you name it. You know, all these views of it. And, and, and Vernon Grounds was confused. And so, and here's this man without a seminary education, just a, a custodian, uh, reading the book of Revelation. And Vernon Grounds said, I flippantly said to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, I do which shocked Vernon Grounds. And he said to him, well, if you understand it, what does it mean? And this elderly black man looked at him and he said, it means Jesus is a gonna win. <laughs> That's why we can have patient endurance. Patient endurance through financial adversity. Patient endurance through family problems. Patient endurance through cancer and physical affliction. Patient endurance that when God is not changing our circumstances, He is changing us in the circumstances. So John identifies himself in three ways. As the person to whom Christ reveals himself. Servant, brother, and companion. Companion in tribulation. Companion in kingdom and companion in patient endurance. Then there's the place where Christ reveals himself. He reveals himself when we are in the Spirit. When we are in the Spirit. My wife and I several years ago were in Toledo, Spain and we were in the cathedral and we were looking at various pieces of art that were done by the Greek painter El Greco and El Greco at one point in his career had paintings where he had uh, what was called the underside and the upper side. And this particular painting was a painting on the bottom side. It was a huge painting of the death of a count. And you could see uh, this richly ornamented tapestry of the cathedral and the, and the formally um, dressed uh, cardinals and noblemen of the period and the family gathered around the, the beer and the Cat, the corpse laying on top of it and everybody's face is downcast and it's sad and then on the upper side uh, the, the, the whole mood changes uh, the person that has died is being ushered into heaven Christ is waiting for him the angels are rejoicing and it was El Greco's way of saying that for every downside scene in life there is an upper scene yes. and that's what John sees on the island of Patmos he is in prison but he is in the spirit and when you're in the spirit it doesn't matter if you are in prison because in the spirit you see the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning. It's from places like Patmos that we see the new heaven and the new earth. 
It's in a place like Patmos that we see the new Jerusalem descending as a bride adorned for her husband. It is when we are in worship. It is when we are on our knees. It is when our hearts are open to the Holy Spirit that we see the reality of what all that is to come and it hath not yet been revealed to us all that God has planned for us. I hath not seen nor hath ear heard nor hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. In the spirit we, we begin to get a glimmer of what it will be like when we see Jesus all sorrows will erase. So John is in the spirit and if you're in a hard place without the spirit you're just in a hard place. But if you're in a hard place with the Spirit and in the Spirit, then you can see things far more clearly. Well, then you not only have the person and the place, but you have the portrait of Christ revealed in power and authority. And where we see Jesus standing is in the midst of his church, in the midst of individual lampstands, not a menorah, but individual lampstands. The church is seen as lampstands because the world is dark. In fact, Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 2, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Today, where is Jesus? He is standing among Christ's gospel churches around the world. And he is standing in regal or formal attire. Uh, one of the things I appreciate about Christ's gospel, and maybe I'm now in the older generation since I'm 73, yeah. just a kid compared to Reverend Hicks, but you know, <laughs> I have to kid her a little bit. But um, one of the things I appreciate about Christ's gospel is you come dressed up to church. I don't, uh, so many places today, even the pastor has a sh shirt out and raggedy blue jeans with holes in the blue jeans, and I guess trying to relate to the younger generation, I found that the message probably relates better than just trying to look cute. But uh, that's, uh, it's just a personal kind of thing. Uh, but in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus in formal attire. In fact, He's identified as the Son of Man. Now that, that is a word which trips people up that don't know the Bible because the initial feeling when you hear that term Son of Man is that it's a term related to his humanity. But that's not the case. It's Jesus' code word for himself. In fact, he is the only one that uses the term in the Gospels. Jesus uses that as a self-identifier. Why? Because of Daniel chapter 7. Yeah. The Son of Man, the divine being coming out of heaven. It's like, the term is like his parables. It conceals truth to those who are on the outside. It reveals truth to those who are on the inside. And the fact that he is the Son of Man is a term which means he is resplendently divine in all of the glory of the Father from heaven. And his uh, garment is one worn by kings or priests, robed to his feet with a golden sash. Jesus had, John the disciple had once stood at the cross and saw the suffering, a disrobed Christ. Now he sees Jesus in his majesty, King of kings and Lord of lords. I think it's an important division we have of Jesus. I remember when our little, our boy was uh, a little little, maybe he was seven years of age, and we gave him a, 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 a painting of a, of a boy with a small, of Jesus rather, handing a boy a small handmade boat in the carpenter shop. Because he wanted to represent to our son Jesus as a friend of boys. Now in the book of Revelation, we see him again, not simply as a friend. But we see him as powerful Lord. The one who has power beyond all other. King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we look at the various descriptions that John gives. His head and his hair. His, his head and hair are like wool, like white as snow, standing for age and purity. He keeps his covenant of love a thousand generations to those who love him and keep his commandments. His eyes are a blazing fire. He has x-ray vision. 
And that x-ray vision sees the churches. He sees into Ephesus, its doctrinal purity without passion. He sees into Smyrna, its fidelity despite severe trial. He sees into Pergamum, compromise in a minority that is tolerated by a majority. He sees into Thyatira, compromise in a majority tolerated by a minority. He sees into Sardis, external success not matched by internal character. He sees into Philadelphia, little strength with an open door. He sees into Laodicea, a church that is lukewarm and does not satisfy his thirst. And he sees into your life and into my life. He sees better than any x-ray machine. And guess what? He not only has the diagnosis, he has the cure. He has the cure. The blood of Jesus Christ covers us from all sins. His feet are glowing like bronze in a furnace. No one is going to step on Jesus' toes. When you're shod with feet that are bronze, there ain't nobody going to hurt you. He has a voice like the sound of many waters or rushing waters. John was never out of sound of hearing the booming surf. I've been on Patmos. I've heard that surf. The constant sound, distinguishable from all other sounds, the voice of Jesus, which rises above and takes precedence over all other voices. And in his right hand are the seven stars, the angels, the pastors of the churches. He's got a grip on leaders. And the word for grip there, there's two ways to hold something. One way to hold something is to hold a heavy object with your fingers down, in which case you'll let it slip out after a while. But when your fingers are up and you're holding a heavy object in your palm, he's got you secure in his grip. Grip. And that's the word secure here. It is the grip of Jesus on his leadership, on his people, and on his church. And in his mouth is a sharp two-edged sword. It's sharp and edged. That is, it's used for close-in fighting because he intends to use it. Words to cut away our spiritual cancers. And his face is shining like the sun in all of its brilliance. Here is the portrait of Jesus in his church, the Messiah, the priest king, divine, all-seeing, all-powerful, speaking, protecting, fighting, dazzling. That is our risen Lord. What does John do? John falls down at his feet as one dead. John's great contribution to the body of Christ, his gospel and the book of Revelation, written when he was in his 90s. Sister Hicks is still writing as well. John writing when he is in his 90s. That writing of the book of Revelation is preceded by John being flat on his face before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and all great advances in the kingdom of God come the same way when we are flat on our face before him, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So what does the risen Lord say to us? What does he say to John. In the kind of times in which John lived, in the kind of times in which we live, what does the Lord have to say to us? First word out of his mouth, do not fear. Do not fear. It's an apt word for a time of danger. I was looking at one of our publications that goes all the way back to 1913. And that was just before the outbreak of World War I. And this writer not given the name, but says, if I think of the world, I get the impression of the world. If I think of my trials and my sorrows, I get the impress of my trials and sorrows. If I think of my failures, I get the impress of my failures. If I think of Christ, I get the impress, the stamp of Christ. Jesus says it to John, first non-verbally by placing his right hand on John and then the same hand that holds the stars is placed on John. And Jesus gives three reasons why we're not to fear. I, he says, I'm the first and the last. There's no one before me and no one after me. You are sandwiched between. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Of Jesus, it is, it is different than every other human being because every other human being, they lived and died, but Jesus died and lived and lives today and lives ever interceding at the right hand of God. And he says, thirdly, don't fear because I hold the keys to hell and death. We need not, go, we need not fear any place to go where Jesus has the keys. He has the keys. I was struck... Uh, I was sharing this story recently with, a, with some people about um, one of my st 
stupid statements. You know, Saul can say some crazy things. You're all aware of that, right? <laughs> well, I, I've had a few myself. We had this couple in the church, and for some reason, uh, he had, uh, the husband, Milt, had made a promise to his wife that he would die last so she didn't have to have the grief of burying him. Well, then he, after about 25 years of marriage, came down with cancer and uh, did not want to, uh, uh, they, they just couldn't talk about it. They just wouldn't talk about it. And so he, in the terminal stages of cancer, goes into the hospital and is in and out of a coma. And I'm visiting them as pastor and I'm coming down the hallway to go into his room and Doris, his wife, meets me and she says, uh, Pastor, she said, Milt has just come out of his coma. Uh, he is, um, he's probably going to pass today. And you have arrived just at the right time. So please come here with me, talk to him and pray for him. I said, okay. So we talked a while and, uh, and Doris uh, re reflected that uh, just as he had come out of the coma, he had said to her, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going home today. And she said, oh, Milt, you can't go home. You're too sick. No, he said, not that home. And he said, would you forgive me? And she thought about why he said that for a moment and then realized that he had made the promise he would die last and now he's dying first. Would you forgive me? Of course. The room was filled with tears. It's a very emotional moment and I thought I would try to bring some comfort in that situation. <laughs> and I said, Milt, you know, when you read the Bible, it says that when Jesus ascended, he sat down at the right hand of God and he's there today. But I said, the scripture also says in Acts chapter seven, that when Stephen died, the first Christian to die, after the first believer to die, that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And I said, Jesus, ever the gentleman, rises from his throne of glory to greet believers that are coming through the gate. And I said, so Jesus, you'll, you'll see Jesus. If the Lord doesn't heal you today, you'll see Jesus. And like he greeted Stephen, he'll, he'll greet you as well. And it was a very sober, very tender moment. And then is when I made the mistake. <laughs> I said to him, I was so caught up with the fact that he was going to see Jesus in just a few hours in the flesh that I said to him, and when you see Jesus, will you tell him hi for me? <laughs> As though I hadn't talked to the Lord earlier that morning, you know, <laughs> and all through the day. But Jesus does hold the keys to death and hell. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That is, shall never die a separation from God. There are two deaths. Natural death, separation from our fellow human beings. And spiritual death, separation from God. Jesus came so that we would never have to die the second death. Never a separation between us and God. The Lord's revelation to us is still personal. He came to John, he comes to me, he comes to you personally. The same Jesus who appeared to John in the book of Revelation is the Jesus who comes to you, who gives you assignments for his work, who tells you he loves you and cares for you and forgives you. The resurrected, ascended Christ sees your particular lampstand, your place of in influence. And I invite you to do what John did to own him as Savior and Lord and let him seal something in your heart that forever brands you as the servant of Jesus Christ, as brother in the kingdom, and as a follower of the Lord in your life. The Christ of Christ's gospel is the Christ who always lives and reigns. He will always live and reign because he is alive.